Very good afternoon. I'm Annika Hedberg. I'm I'm head of Sustainable for Europe Today is an excellent panel of speakers to discuss the renovation way for buildings. How can we make the most of it? We have some 130 registered participants for the discussion today, and we very much look forward to this interesting event with you, which we are extremely pleased to organize together with EURIMA, European Insulation Manufacturers Association. Just some practicalities before we start. If you're interested to ask questions, there are two ways for you to do that. I'll give you opportunity to speak out, but you can also ask written questions in the space provided. And if you do this, just please do keep your questions short. Our member of the European Parliament, Mia Petra Kumpula Natri, will unfortunately have to leave at 2.30. So if you have any specific questions for her, please write them in the space provided and we can try to pick on them before she leaves. And otherwise, we're happy to hear all your other comments, questions during the Q&A. As for the topic of today, I think it's interesting to start with the fact that 85 to 95 percent of the buildings around us will still be in use in 2050, when the EU should be climate neutral. Thus, taking that buildings could play a major role in reducing our emissions and cleaning our energy system. It's no surprise that this has been, and the role of the buildings has also been recognized in Commission's proposal for Green Deal. And now that the Corona crisis is on and the EU is looking desperately for ways to recover, it's increasingly recognized that refurbishing and renovating existing building stock could build, bring multiple ben benefits. And this is not just for climate action, but also in creating jobs and in bringing wider societal benefits. The renovation name is a very good apt name for the interest and push that we're currently seeing for improving the existing building stock. And the building, the principles and the goals have been set in the new renovation strategy that has been pro uh, proposed by the European Commission. Today's discussion provides us an occasion to discuss, obviously, the content of the strategy and how it could help to improve the current state of play with our existing building stock. But we also hope to have promote and promote frank exchange on the barriers that need to be addressed, what could be improved and what should not be forgotten when we design and implement measures. Because we surely want to make the most that the renovation wave can bring for Europe. To move on to the discussion, as our first speaker, we'll have Stefan Moser, Head of Units uh, for Energy Efficiency, Buildings and Products at the European Commission. We're very happy to give him a floor. He unfortunately is not able to join us currently uh, with the screen, uh, but we will be showing his slides and he will be able to, I hope, join us orally. Stefan, you're here with us. Hello, good afternoon. Um, Annika, can you can you hear me? We can hear you very well, thank you. Very good. Also, uh, to Natalie, many thanks for the uh, for the organization. I had a technical problem. I have to apologize. Um, my laptop didn't, from the system requirements, allow me did not allow me to to um, to join directly. So I joined via the iPhone and have landed on the on the participant side, so not on the speaker side. Apologies for that. So uh, and thanks for sharing my presentation then from from your side. So the renovation wave um, is basically. Uh, a comprehensive strategy is an action plan. Um, it is not uh, solving anything in itself, but uh, of course, um, trying to identify the actions which which the Commission, but also the member states and stakeholders should take forward in our view in order to create uh, multiple benefits. It's a win-win from our side to green uh, buildings, but also create jobs for the recovery and improving lives more broadly, including um, uh, addressing affordability and energy poverty um, issues. Uh, so on the on the next slide, um, you see um, a bit how we um, how we see the reasons why we should address actually renovations um, uh, for the increased ambition of the Green Deal by 2030. 
it is um, absolutely essential to address buildings because they uh, take up so much energy and um, produce so many greenhouse gas emissions, 40% or 36% respectively. So that's a sizable uh, share. Um, and um, a large proportion of the building stock is over 20, year old, 20 years old and um, uh, consumes much more energy than new builds. So, and we can of course not tear down and should not tear down all the existing buildings. Our renovations is the only solution. It's also a solution to uh, reduce pressure on the natural environment by improving what we have instead of just building on greenfields new developments and abandon uh, the inner cities or, or already built up environment. So it's also basically um, very much in line with our objectives to preserve nature. Um, but um, as mentioned already, energy poverty, uh, it's a reflection of poverty more broadly, but of course it's, it's directly um, relevant in the energy domain. More than 30 million people are experiencing difficulties in heating or cooling their homes appropriately or have otherwise difficulties in paying for their energy. And that is something which is uh, a shame, which has to be addressed um, uh, collectively. And, uh, and it's a main priority also of, of this strategy. Um, the opportunity created uh, from the Recovery and Resilience Funds, which have been set up uh, due to the COVID crisis, um, have allowed us to have basically a kind of win-win situation, economic recovery, using significant funds made available in addition to what normally we have under the multi-annual financial framework to have an additional pot of money. And renovations are something which, uh, which could serve multiple benefits in that respect because it could create employment for people who may not be able to go back to their initial jobs uh, even after the crisis because there may be structural changes. And there will be a need for, for people moving into the renovation sector, not just as workers, but also as advisors, as consultants, as designers, uh, so also very high value jobs for a long time. So this is not just for a few years, this will be over the next decades, basically, that we have to do that. And uh, the, the needs for financing are very high. Um, a few hundred billion euros investments uh, needed in addition for 2030, not just on renovations. And as said, the recovery uh, funds can be used to, to a large extent uh, to do that uh, in addition to other um, sources of financing which we have. If you move to the next slide, please. Um, you, you can see that we see the uh, um, renovation wave as a transformative agenda, really um, climate neutral buildings, uh, not only um, climate mitigation, but also uh, climate adaptation, uh, making buildings more resilient to, to extreme natural events, heat waves, but also floodings, etc. Uh, then uh, the, the, the twin transition as we're experiencing it, uh, buildings have to be fit for the future in terms of smart readiness. They have to be uh, connected and connectable to ever smart, smarter devices in the future, which will, will of course uh, be further improved. Um, and also connectivity to other sectors, notably the transport sector, e-mobility, um, cars, but also bikes and 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 other uh, devices which need electricity so there has to be the connectivity uh, needed for that um, and then uh, a very strong focus on neighborhood and community approaches we we have to move beyond the looking at individual buildings but have um, a more strategic vision at, at neighborhood district um, level um, to make buildings healthier greener and 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 more accessible also um, on the next slide, please. Um, there you see the, the key principles which we have identified, um, uh, which are, um, of course, energy efficiency, but also, as mentioned, affordability, uh, energy poverty, then uh, the transition, um, digital transition, renewable transition, uh, but also avoiding uh, waste in a life cycle thinking and circularity to be able to recycle uh, materials which have been used, avoiding uh, the waste of precious and rare materials uh, after the end of life of buildings. And then very importantly, when, when implementing and when designing renovation strategies, also at local level, think about health and uh, good environmental performance of buildings, indoor as well as outdoor. 
um, and then also a high aesthetical uh, quality, high architectural quality, because that is part of, of uh, our life, uh, our lives as citizens. We want to have uh, attractive cities um, and of, of high quality in terms of design, but also uh, livability. So that is uh, goes hand in hand with the other uh, partly more functional aspects like energy efficiency. On the next slide, um, you uh, can see the, the main objective. So the main objective politically is to at least double the renovation rate in terms of energy renovation by 2030 and also increase the depth of renovations. Um, the, this will have to be quantified and, and made more operational in the upcoming revision of the uh, Energy Performance in Buildings Directive. There's not yet a, a, a very precise definition of what a deep renovation is. It means in qualitative terms, uh, use the full potential and not just a little bit um, uh, improvements of energy efficiency, but really uh, go to uh, the technical maximum or the optimum basically of what can be done for a building when you do a renovation. Um, of course, the, the main motivation uh, for renovating is, is uh, from the climate environment side to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and energy consumption is linked to that. You see the figures on that slide um, and increase the number of renovation um, of building units to be renovated uh, by at least 10 million uh, of, from what would happen anyway, if we just continued with the current rates, this would lead to about 25 million building units to be renovated by 2030. And if we increase our efforts, it would be 35, but also deeper. The doubling of the rate does not happen from today until tomorrow. So this is an, an ongoing effort over the next uh, years. And the link to the recovery uh, agenda, uh, economic recovery is of course the creation of jobs. So 160,000 green jobs would be created in addition in construction and uh, a very high value created from investments uh, about more than 10 jobs. So between 10 and 20 jobs would actually be created per million euros invested. Uh, on the next slide, you see a bit what we have now. We have the clean energy package as uh, recently agreed, which is a solid basis, but it's not in line with the increased ambition level of the Green Deal um, with a climate target of 55%. So it has now to be recalibrated and the remaining barriers uh, holding, back, uh, holding back renovations have to be addressed throughout the, the value chain. Um, on, the, on the next slide, you see a particularly important area, but it's, uh, it's, it's a very specific but particularly important area, which is heating and cooling, which relies to more than three quarters on fossil fuels still today. And, and there, there's a huge potential to, to improve things by having much more renewables in heating and cooling. So to, in, to, to get to a, a share of renewables of about 40%. Um, and, um, and that will require a very um, deep look, uh, both in legislation, but also in the, in the national strategies. What can be done, of course, to replace coal in the first place, but also to uh, electrify, uh, to use geothermal, uh, and if gas will be used, it should of course be decarbonized and, and fully decarbonized in the, in the long term, so to avoid a carbon lock-in in that respect. On the next slide, you see the, the, the seven most important intervention areas identified by the strategy, which is uh, on the one hand regulatory, so improving legislation further, um, then funding, um, then thirdly, um, technical and project assistance, uh, one-stop shops, uh, then have um, uh, the smart readiness of buildings, smart interventions or inter integrated interventions for smart buildings to bring together the different digital tools and improve them further. Uh, then fifthly, the uh, uh, construction sector needs to be upgraded in terms of uh, performance, uh, both in terms of uh, employees, the skills of employees, the number of employees, uh, but also um, the barriers in the internal market have to be broken down further, uh, the competitiveness has to be increased, and in order to, to make also construction materials cheaper and more affordable, um, available in higher numbers, but also cheaper. And then uh, the other two aspects I've already mentioned, addressing energy poverty and healthy house housing, but also decarbonization of, of heating and cooling. 
I think the next slide we can skip, which is a repetition rather in terms of key words, and then go to the following one, please, which um, bring a few elements which we would like to highlight. In, in legislation, we will have to look in particular at minimum energy performance standards, but also energy performance certificates, how to introduce and or improve them, also audits. Um, then uh, on the funding side, I've mentioned already the recovery and resilience plans, in addition to our more traditional multi-annual um, uh, financial framework uh, tools, cohesion policy instruments. There, the member states have to um, prepare the, the plans for recovery and resilience, which have to build on the long-term renovation strategies in order to have the, the appropriate absorption capacity uh for, for to have good projects carried out from from the funding available to to avoid that money is wasted it has to be used to the most effective um in the most effective manner then capacity building it's one-stop shops is the key word bringing together the information relevant for building renovations from the very beginning to the very end uh, of course um, in the transmission of information from the eu level to the member states but even more importantly from the member state central level to the local level so that basically information is accessible easily for citizens wanting to do um, a, a renovation or actually cities uh, the planning authorities um, the different professions uh, that they have the latest information with with low effort uh, that they can draw on that and also good practices what exists elsewhere and then uh, sustainable construction is a key word but also digital construction um, digital readiness, uh, life cycle thinking uh, in the digital data space. And then on heating and cooling, uh, what has been mentioned is the EU ETS um, to extend that to heating and cooling. Uh, but it's only one side of the story. Other instruments will be needed, like uh, the Energy Efficiency Directive and the Rubles Directive to increase the targets for well the, the deployment on of renewable energy in heating and cooling. Thank you. On the sorry, next slide, I, uh, sorry, Stefan. Sorry to interrupt. Um, I just um, as Mia Petra Kumpulonatri, she will have to leave in five minutes. Is it yes. okay if I take her comments now and then we can continue? Because I know that you have two more slides you would like to show us. So I would really like to come back to your slides afterwards. But um, give course. the floor just to Mia Petra now. Thank you. <laughs> of course. Please go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, you're unmuted, Mia Petra. No. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moser. It was uh, nice to have this flexibility and also it is the second uh, seminar we are having today on the on the agenda uh, on our uh, timetables. And I, I very much appreciate the presentation and, 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 and fully align with the Commission targets and aims. Uh, it, I also have a in heritage from the previous mandate, the, the Peter Shadow Rapporteur for the Parliament uh, paper that was already uh, accepted the CUFE report with a long and strong majority from the Parliament on the topic. And uh, it includes issues as renovation, uh, circularity, circularity, the construction materials, life cycle calculation approach, healthy buildings, affordability, requirements for enhanced digitalization and the community uh, approach uh, and energy uh, poverty. So these are the words in inside which are the very important for the parliament and now and, and I hear very same uh, report uh, that the commission uh, strategy renovation uh, wave uh, includes this very much the same point. So now it's still the, the member states to get on board and then the actions to be done. Of course, uh, also the, the previous mandate, I, I was the shadow on this EPPD, the per energy performance in the buildings directive. And a lot of these issues, they are still not in practice, even if that was only to get started with. And uh, especially the uh, member states were asked to give their long-term renovation strategies so that we can understand the different countries with different locations, different climate issues, different landscape and different history, different social uh, uh, benefit programs they have for the, the, the poor uh, uh, part of the um, living uh, people and, and others. And now we only have half of the member states provided their uh, uh, long-term renovation strategies. And then the whole idea was that first we have the local knowledge by the member states, and then we will build the actions. And now I very much encourage, if no member states take part, we still cannot wait. We have to act 
and I very much encourage the Commission to give the proposals that are included in the renovation wave, because otherwise the strategies Europe is well we have enough of strategies if we don't get the players with to play with and also why i miss these uh, long-term renovation strategies as a, as a former lawmaker is also that there was a, a ask for the participation of the uh, stakeholders to be on board to making make the planning and i wish that could also uh, later be even more emphasized this participatory uh, planning when we make the, the neighborhoods uh, and, the, and the cities nicer, whether it's a smart city or uh, is it uh, just the neighborhood renovation and then how to look not only building by building, because that is on one way for the affordability also. All the ways that we can cut the price for the renovation to take place should be uh, turned and looked after. But I am a strong believer that this is the good timing win-win-win can be achieved because it is immediately jobs when we start to renovate. It's immediately cutting the emission and, and energy bills, uh, but only the cost for the renovation is remains high. And it's also, uh, also improving the indoor uh, health when we do it right. And then the modernized uh, buildings, which is also the important uh, to improve the social Europe. Question is now that what can be achieved on the European level? What can we do as a European players and what is the local? And then uh, I was specially asked to, to maybe comment ideas on the affordability and how to make this cheaper. So I do believe that we have to look, uh, we have to try to look also a little bit longer than the few next years. But then for the next years, for example, the uh, building automation control, that was actually my initiative from the previous term time for the EPPD, that it came compulsory. It was only an idea and then we proposed from the parliament that it needs to be compulsory because it can easily pay back and it is actually professional owning if you own a big houses that like uh, hosting the shopping center or hosting the um, offices. So the building automation then immediately also pays back so you can count five to ten years it's normally pays back the in, uh, investment and it's cut the uh, energy needs. But then also there are nice ideas uh, uh, in different countries how the financial in instruments and green subsidies, tax or loan incentives can be done. I appreciate the private banks that they already now can offer a little bit cheaper loan if the energy uh, of, of the house is uh, efficient. Uh, and then all the, all also the ideas kind of property transfer taxes to energy performance in the buildings can be introduced. So we, we, we do have uh, possibilities to look at it. Uh, of course, the energy, all the time we work for the cleaner energy, it helps the houses automatically, but it doesn't automatically take them on board with the digital connectivity uh, and, and these issues remain to be solved. And if uh, more uh, standards can be introduced, we can uh, achieve more and, and more quicker. So not to look uh, device by device, but look the whole system, how it can be done. Uh, if I conclude with my main message here is that we do lack behind of the existing conditions when it comes to the uh, uh, skills and competencies, uh, uh, the, the uh, knowledge. Already I heard that even looking the existing uh, construction uh, guiding uh, principles and, and then the, for the materials as well, we are lacking behind because the day we live in the, the already climate change took place, the humidity has changed, the, the weather conditions has changed. So even if you build according to the existing rules, you might build wrong. And that is uh, very expensive to look at, look at it afterwards. So this very much requires uh, uh, updating. And then also the skills and knowledge. Can you show me the country that is fully using the engineers and construction site workers and others who know everything about circularity? Or do we still, still have to face the fact that 65% of all over uh, total waste generation comes from the building sector? And then we are talking about circularity. So we need something very concrete aims here. Otherwise, this strategy will be nice without uh, really good tools and teeth <laughs> to, to tackle the, the problem. Uh, and uh, I'm also working on the export sector and, and look the uh, follow the US elections and, and well, how to link it here. If we get Biden as a president, he have two billion dollars uh, program for energy transition. And it is said already that it will be also innovating for the technologies to be exported. 
we do have a lot of ideas how to make European continent the first climate neutral and then think everything rest will happen automatically. Yes, it, it will. When we have requirements, there will be businesses. But then also, is there something on this renovation sector or the building sector that we can be leader in the world? Or shall we just use the uh, panels and automotive uh, uh, electrical cars from Asia and then something from the US? Can we also build this together with the industrial strategies that we have? This is my hope that we can even improve uh, the renovation strategy to concrete actions with the member states. And if not, they're having them on board, then make the European legislation that they have to follow. Thank you so much for this overview. And I know that we went over time for you and you'll have to leave. There no, are won't. some questions. What we can do is that we can share the questions with you afterwards so that you know what were some of the elements being raised also after your presentation. But I and I'm sure, so I'm thank so you sure so much for joining us. Commission and Parliament, we share so much. <laughs> Thank you. And it's great to have your input on some of the elements that we need to consider because we will be very happy to pick on these in the other presentations and in the Q&A later on. But uh, thank you and all the best and good luck with the ongoing work. And uh, Stefan Moser, if I can come back to you now, there were some further elements uh, being provided, um, but uh, if I know that you had two more slides you wanted to show and share with us. So um, we'll be happy to go through them as well before we move on. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Annika. And indeed, we, uh, the Parliament and, and the Commission, share uh, pretty much uh, yeah, the, uh, the priorities, basically, and, and the own initiative report by the Parliament um, has been a very valuable um, um, input um, and, and, and guidance for the Commission also in, in drawing up the renovation strategy as uh, the input from, from many stakeholders from the public consultation, which we have uh, carried out. I think on this slide, um, uh, the, the key thing which I still would like to mention um, uh, are the public buildings as one of the three focus areas of the renovation wave strategy, heating and cooling and energy poverty I mentioned already. Um, um, public buildings are exemplary, um, um, but we don't see them as ideologically um, uh, as the front runner basically of everything else because public funds and also private money is limited so we have to prioritize where we invest and that should also also be done within the public buildings and uh, the important aspect here is really to 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 maximize the impact the added value um, but uh, think also more broadly beyond energy efficiency but uh, at, at the qual about the quality of services by public buildings um, public buildings not only publicly owned ones but also buildings with a public mission with a social uh, component, so social care facilities, uh, schools, hospitals, um, uh, offices, uh, etc. Uh, and that requires an in-depth assessment, also a prioritization by the member states. If I say member states, it means also the local level, um, what to tackle first and, and what actually would benefit most from a renovation to upgrade the quality of, of the services more broadly of of that and and if we think about our schools in Europe or hospitals in, in Europe there are many improvements still to be done uh, when they are old and and not up to standard anymore so uh, that should be tackled as a priority in the interest of society um, so and on on energy poverty I had mentioned that already um, just to say also that the Commission uh, presented on the same day on the 14th of October a recommendation on energy poverty and the member states should also develop effective strategies to combat energy poverty through renovation. Um, it's of course poverty more broadly because as said for the public buildings it's about the services of a building in which people live. Uh, often it's it's run down, it is not any more modern, it's, it's not fun, it's not um, basically uh, um, uh, acceptable even for many people to live in that building anymore um, and, and that I think uh, can be addressed also through a renovation. Um, there will also be an affordable housing initiative from the Commission from, from our colleagues in DG Grow uh, which will further address uh, energy poverty but also affordability through lighthouse projects and uh, I think that will provide also significant added value and benefits. On the last slide this is just a, a um, 
a summary of, of the financial implications and the different financing instruments which exist, uh, uh, summarizing a paper which we have published on the same day, uh, uh, which explains the different financing components uh, from the EU budget, but also highlighting that there will have to be a very strong cooperation with the private sector to leverage also private investments through InvestEU. Um, and um, that will be absolutely crucial to, 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 to lead to the necessary level of renovations. Uh, there's also the research and innovation component through Horizon Europe, um, then the technical assistance uh, side uh, through the Elena facility, but also a few other support instruments which have been drawn up. And there's also a support service from in the Commission giving advice to the member states directly uh, at their request um, on reform programs uh, so they can ask for technical help. Of course, this is not always provided only by the Commission, but rather through a network of those who are able to do that, including in cooperation with other member states. And also what is important is to address market barriers. Um, their, their projects also in financing available under the LIFE uh, projects. Uh, uh, clean energy transition and, and circular economy. So with that, I would like to to thank you again for your attention, and um, and I'm happy to 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 um, discuss and and look forward to the to the exchange of views with you. Thank you very much. This, all these elements being put on uh, on the table, it clearly is and aims to be a very transformative and comprehensive agenda that can bring multiple benefits. And as uh, Mia, Petra, Kumpula, Natri mentioned as well, obviously it does require enormous collaboration as well. As, and we do need to bring different sectors together in making it happen. But very happy to come and pick up on the various elements you've raised in the in the discussion. But uh, let's move on to our next speaker, uh, Pascal Evegard, uh, Chairman uh, at EURIMA, from perspective of European insulation manufacturers. Uh, what are your views on the strategy? And uh, do you see some challenges to be met, uh, possibilities to be captured? <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, I would like to say that uh, we are very happy as EURIMA to sponsor this uh, policy dialogue on the renovation wave. Um, I, I think that today buildings are not only at the center of the policy agenda, as we have just heard from, uh, from the, the, the European Commission, but more and more also on people's minds. Everyone, and I believe uh, each of us, starts to realize the importance that buildings play in our lives, and especially at this very special moment where we are forced to spend uh, more and more time inside. Uh, of, this, uh, of these buildings, and especially in our homes. Um, and uh, I think starting from this point, there is a high chance that uh, people might realize or might start to realize that they do not feel always very comfortable in their house, that they now pay more attention to the indoor air quality, the acoustics, not being necessarily very satisfied with uh, what they have. Numbers can also confirm uh, this uh, statement. Uh, a recent research by BPIE found that 93% of buildings are energy inefficient. And we know that when a building is not efficient in terms of energy, it is not able to offer to its occupants uh, the multiple health and well-being benefits that are uh, closely linked to uh, energy efficiency. That is why the European Commission Renovation Wave Strategy uh, acts as, as a crucial element. Uh, it has the potential to improve Europeans' lives, to tackle climate change, and last but not least, to restart the economy. All the studies produced in the light of the green uh, recovery have shown that for one million invested in renovation, an average of 18 jobs can be created. So this was reminded by uh, Mr. Moser, but this is a, a very important point. Therefore, we certainly welcome uh, three elements. First, the political drive that is uh, uh, clear and strong, the recognition of the role of buildings in meeting the 2030 uh, targets, as well as uh, the 2050 carbon neutrality objective, and also the ambition of the document to at least double the renovation rate from the current 1% and also to increase uh, the, the rate of deep renovation, which is currently only at 0.2%. Uh, 
So uh, we may hope that uh, this uh, deep renovation rate uh, will uh, increase up to 2%, so that all renovations will be uh, deep renovations, but this means uh, to be, uh, then, then we need to multiply by 10 uh, the, the level of deep renovation, which is a, a real challenge. We also welcome the, the three pillars, uh, the three pillar approach uh, developed by the Commission, which mixes uh, three fundamental ingredients, according to us, to kickstart the renovation market regulation, financing, and technical support. On the regulation side, uh, we were very pleased to see. Uh, this reference to minimum energy performance standards for existing buildings. Uh, as you remember, we are since long time advocating for their introduction, and we believe that they can really stimulate the volume and depth of renovation, which is essential for the EU to meet its climate targets. Um, they should, uh, these uh, minimum requirements should become uh, our compass for renovation. In addition, these standards signal the pathway and the destination for the entire building stocks, as well as for each individual building. This will help to align the demand for supply chain. This will provide impetus for business and innovation. They can also drive the take up of funding, finance and incentives, improving the effectiveness and the absorption of existing and, and new programs. And to give you a, a market example, uh, I know that uh, Louise Sunderland will probably probably uh, come back in more details on this example. In the Netherlands, from 2030, any office that has an energy performance certificate lower than Class C will not be considered fit for purpose and uh, not be used as office until it is renovated. And actually, when this was announced in 2012, uh, this had immediately a strong impact on the market and it has resulted in a vast majority of the new office buildings to be uh, classified in the best classes. So we, we saw directly uh, uh, the, the impact, positive impact of this uh, minimum uh, performance requir requirements uh, on the entire building stock. But uh, with these uh, important and positive promises, we should still ask ourselves how big this wave uh, will be and how long it will last. And to, tr to transform this wave into an impactful and long-lasting initiative, we see three important points where we should further be working on. First, we need to be able to mobilize the required investment to deliver on the renovation wave and meet the targets. We know that important amounts of funding for renovation are today available via different streams. This was also reminded uh, by Mr. Moser, but we are still miss missing a, a dedicated EU renovation management uh, renovation uh, facility with a dedicated earmarked uh, fund. And this facility could uh, act as a real one-stop shop for supporting member states in their efforts. And um, uh, it's not just good to have money, it's even better if uh, the money is uh, clearly identified and uh, earmarked and easy to access. Secondly, there is a missing element that could still uh, hamper our renovation efforts, uh, which are the long-term renovation strategies. We see them as uh, essential tools for member states to plan and implement renovation projects uh, at, uh, at each and every level. And uh, unfortunately, uh, only half of the member states have developed and, uh, and delivered uh, those uh, strategies, which is uh, really uh, a pity because uh, we, we are very much convinced that uh, such a road mapping exercise uh, is essential to mobilize both human and financial resources and also to, to plan uh, the, the, the training and the, the development of the skills that are needed on the market. And thirdly, when talking about the minimum energy performance requirements, we would like also to remind the importance to look at them in, as an instrument for the long term. Pushing the worst performing building out of the market, um, uh, a positive dynamic should be installed to ensure they also work as a pool towards the higher performance classes, giving a long-term perspective for our building stock towards the goal of achieving highly energy energy efficient and decarbonized stock by 2050. This can be done by, uh, for instance, foreseeing a progressive tightening of the standards over time. So there is a, 
uh, for sure uh, the implementation will have to be local but we are very confident that, that uh, uh, this minimum energy performance requirements will uh, will provide will be the tool the, the, the strategic tool to 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 shape uh, completely uh, the profile of our building stock for the future i will be very short now i'm almost uh, to the end of what i wanted to say um, i think that uh, the strategy contains also uh, other very positive elements such as uh, the focus on public buildings schools and hospitals and also the push for renovating the worst performing buildings to reduce energy poverty we also welcome the reference to circularity uh, which uh, we think is also an important part of this renovation uh, wave and we support the work for an evolution of buildings codes to account for the whole life cycle carbon impacts Yurima's vision for the future is to achieve a sustainable built environment where next to energy further sustainability aspects will be optimized the levels framework developed by the commission should be the starting point for this uh, future evolution so this is uh, what I wanted to say, a very positive renovation wave uh, uh, communication, still a lot to be made to, to transform uh, the, 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 the points into a real success, into uh, an impacting wave. And uh, I look forward uh, for the discussion. Thank you so much for the overview and also we really need to emphasize and make sure we address uh, going forward. We'll be happy to come uh, back to Stefan Moser for some reactions on these as well. As our last speaker, we have uh, Louis Sunderland, a senior advisor for the Regulatory Assistance Project. And we're very delighted to have you with us and to tell your views on the strategy. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, wow, it's always difficult coming last, isn't it? There's so many um, uh, interesting and important things um, that have already been said, and I agree with all of them. So I'm going to try and fill in fill in the gaps if I can, um, but also you know, um, agree and amplify um, where I think it's important. And I think probably the first point on that is, um, as Pascal just said, you know, that I think the, the kind of simple three part uh, framework that we need for, for a renovation um, strategy or renovation framework is, is a three part. I've heard, it, I've heard it described as the holy trinity, which I rather liked. And that is obviously appropriate funding and finance um, that you know, is suitable for all building types and all building owners, the technical and financial support that Stefan uh, described as, as being really important at the kind of member state program design level, but also really important at the local level for the building owners to actually manage to navigate their way through their renovations. And then the third one, of course, is the demand creation. And, and, and this is what we're now seeing with the minimum energy performance standards coming in. And I really believe that to date, this is what we have been struggling with. And this is what we've been missing. Um, and I, you know, we've been relying on information, communication tools, incentives, finance provision, um, which, you know, which will get us so far. But I really think this kind of stronger driver is is super important in the moment. So it's really good to see that the Commission have, um, you know, committed in the renovation way strategy. And just to say, the Commission with this vote of confidence in minimum energy performance standards is not alone. Um, there's, I think, huge interest across the world at the moment in in these kinds of policies, and it, I think there's a huge realization that it is time to regulate now. We we need to get on with this, and we need these these clear regulatory backstops. For example, I was just on a webinar last night with Australian stakeholders and the Australian governments that are really interested in what's going on in Europe and and across the world in in, in America as well, looking for what they can learn. Um, with regard to rolling out um, a, a housing quality standard that has an energy efficiency elements in it across the country. I've just seen a report this week uh, highlighting a further five cities in, in US states um, that are introducing building performance standards there. And just last month, uh, the UK uh, the, uh, government have released a consultation proposing to increase the ambition of its standard, this is one of our oldest standards in, in Europe now, its standard at the moment for privately rented homes is an EPC level to be achieved. They're actually proposing to raise that standard from EPC, uh, sorry, EPC E currently, they're proposing to raise that to EPC C, which is obviously inc incredibly more ambitious. And I think all of those examples just really show that there is a huge faith and confidence in um, this policy family um, and, and, and the need for that to drive the renovations that we need at the moment. Um, 
And I'm really glad to say that the renovation wave does cover this kind of holy trinity of headlines that we need. It also um, contains um, some other great stuff. Uh, importantly, I think the, um, the measures around EPCs, reforming EPCs to improve building assessment, um, building performance communication, and also the data that those EPCs collect, all of which is really important, I think, particularly from the minimum measure performance standards point of view, to allow member states to design standards mm -hmm. Uh, on the basis of data and knowledge of their stocks. Um, I think the deep retrofit standard is also uh, really important um, to make clear what we're aiming for and what we want to achieve with renovations. We really need to move from the place we are in Europe at the moment where the majority of renovations don't, do not save very much energy and we need to be absolutely much clearer with ourselves about where we need to be heading for. Um, and then I think perhaps the element that hasn't been mentioned quite so much uh, by previous speakers but I also see as one of the most important elements is the the need recognised um, in the renovation wave to strengthen the heating and cooling decarbonisation plans and very importantly to coordinate these with renovation plans. Um, so I think you know the, the decarbonisation of our heating and cooling systems needs to go hand in hand with this trajectory set out by our minimum energy performance standards for our buildings to become more efficient but also more flexible. Um, so buildings can serve as a flexible resource to the decarbonised systems and the systems can efficiently serve the needs of the stock. I think that, that, you know, that connection really needs to be kind of firmed up. Um, so I think in general, there's some great elements of the strategy. Uh, there's an awful lot of work still to do. Um, and I'm trying to think about what my headlines are um, for the kind of the biggest challenges or, or the most important things to do next. Um, I think inevitably, uh, we, we, we have this big challenge. Um, it's a great challenge to have, but I think it is a challenge between now and the end of next year when we um, when we write minimum energy performance standards into legislation in the EPBD, we need to think about how do we create a European framework that is ambitious enough to deliver on the goals that we, we, need, we need to deliver within our existing stock, but also flexible enough to ensure that the member states can design minimum energy performance standards that are appropriate to their local uh, context, that are appropriate to the stocks, their own decarbonisation pathways. And um, we've already seen from the minimum energy st performance standards taken up in member states already that, that, that different member states are doing them differently. They're, they're taking different approaches. So I think we absolutely need to figure out how how we maintain that, that flexibility while driving ambition. So that's the first one. I, and I think the, the second real challenge that I see um, coming before us is, is how we translate um, this whole European framework that we're seeing articulated in the renovation way to down to the local level where the activity needs to happen. Um, and I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges now. And, and we need to really um, scale up and, and, and create the resources at that local level very soon. You know, it, it needs to be happening, you know, immediately. And I think it's already been said, but just to reiter re reiterate that the local level, of course, is incredibly important because as a building owner approaching a renovation, the local level is the accessible level you go to to find, find the supply chain of contractors, to find the, the renovation support that you need. But also from the minimum energy performance standards level, when I've work, done work to look across all the standards across the world, universally, compliance and, uh, with the standard and enforcement is placed at, Europe, uh, at the local level. So that, at, that is at the local authority level or the city authority level. So we see they're forming this very important role of the kind of hand in glove relationship between enabling renovation and then eventually enforcing the minimum energy performance standard much further down the line when it comes at that local level also obviously returning to the point about you know local decarbonization of heating and cooling plans that will need to be integrated there and i think also this this very important point about ensuring that any any renovation strategy any minimum energy performance strategy is really embedded within social and affordable housing policies, um, which are uh, which are local in nature and which also are monitored locally. So I think it's really important to ensure that that uh, renovation standards and renovations don't have negative social impacts um, and importantly make housing less affordable. And I think all of those social impacts need to be monitored at that local level. So. You know, lo local is, is a word I've <laughs> overused, but I, and I think that's a really big challenge to have to take this, this great strategy we ha now have and make sure it's delivered effectively locally. Uh, and I think that just goes on maybe to the last point I'd like to, to make, which um, is actually a, an area in which I think the renovation wave strategy could do better. Um, and that is uh, ring fence support for renovations. Not only, as Pascal says, 
renovations uh, ring fence support for renovations but ring fence support for renovations for low-income households um, I mean it's very very clear that low-income households energy poor households will need financial support to renovate um, and actually a new standard a requirement a regulation to renovate should not fall in, as a cost burden an extra cost burden on on households that are already really struggling so i think this is really an area we need to give much more focus now um, and i think although it was very useful that the commission has outlined all of the finance and funding available and suitable for renovation i think what it has very much done is, is left the ring fencing of those funds for low income or energy poor uh, support up to member states and I think member states have a, a real challenge in front of them, given a lot of other competing priorities to make that ring fencing, make prioritize that money. Um, and I therefore don't think it's a foregone conclusion that we will find uh, adequate support for low income uh, renovation. So what's the solution to this? Um, I think the renovation wave does actually mention one very good solution, which is uh, uh, the suitability of ring fencing revenues from the emissions trading scheme. Um, for uh, use to to support lo low income households to renovate their homes, and this is something a piece of work that you know, Rat's done a lot of work on. Um, there's a very clear carbon rationale to reinvest revenues from a pricing scheme to create more carbon savings. And in fact, more carbon savings can be created with the use of the revenues than just through the created by the price signal alone. Um, but also from the distributional equity point of view, that if you are going to raise the the price of energy, um, that cost burden falls heavily, most heavily on low income households and we absolutely need to use those revenues then to, um, to uh, soften the burden and, and even I would go for, further actually create benefits for those households that really outweigh those, those cost burdens. Um, and just the last one, I think it's really important at this juncture where the Commission is, um, is proposing extending the ETS, carbon pricing through the ETS to heating fuels we will be raising the price of heating um, for households across Europe at a time when a lot of um, households are struggling to pay their bills. Um, so I, I do think, therefore, you know, the distributional impact of that measure being introduced at European level needs to be assessed at European level and dealt with at European level. And I think that, that probably does mean um, some kind of European fund um, that's dedicated to uh, renovation energy efficiency measures um, to reduce bills uh, across both heating and transport, actually, if we extend the ETS to both fuels uh, for low-income households. Thank you so much for the overall and uh, provider as well. Happy to return to Stefan Moser uh, if you're there. We also have um, some questions from the audience, but I'll be happy to give you a chance to react to what you've heard, come back uh, with any comments you may have, and then put in a question that was specifically addressed to you by Clotilde Clark. Volgier from the uh, Beanza, uh, who's asking, how does the European Commission plan to shape the renovation wave and support member states so that it will not lead to increasing rents and therefore further exclusion of lowest income groups? So, Stefan, if you can take this first one and respond uh, to what you've heard so far, that would be great. Thanks a lot, uh, Annika, Louise, and, and Pascal. Um, uh, just uh, the last uh, half a minute, uh, um, the, 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 the voice broke up, so I didn't fully understand anymore what you were saying, but uh, I, I heard that I should react to Louise and, and, and Pascal. Um, so um, I think we are very much on, the, on, on a similar route. Um, what we are certainly conscious of is that uh, the renovation wave requires a lot of further work. It is, um, it is an action plan. Uh, uh, the, the, the different actions have to be fleshed out. We have to develop options and then also do public consultations, impact assessments where it comes to legislation. Um, what has not been done uh, indeed is to, to ring fence uh, um, beyond a certain degree um, what member states have to do with the, uh, with the, with the funds. Uh, uh, the, the, the most important um, ring fencing to some extent is, is the figure of 37 percent for climate uh, investments to be done as part of the recovery and resilience plans but it's not even 
said that this is um, specifically for innovation. Yeah? So member states are free within that 37 um, percent um, uh, threshold to uh, to invest that on climate, um, and uh, that can of course also be renewable energy. What the Commission will do is of course to uh, to analyze um, whether it's a balanced strategy from each member state's point of view. It doesn't have to be the same figure everywhere, and I think. What you said also in in relation to ring fencing support uh, uh, in for for low income households, uh, I fully agree with the objective uh, that um, uh, a particular attention has to be paid um, not to create additional cost burdens for low income families uh, because that would be really uh, I mean uh, socially not acceptable and and would be completely un um, unfair also. Um, but it's something which uh, the Commission has always had and still has difficulties in imposing on member states how to do that precisely, because it's a question of subsidiarity and also looking at the uh, at the specific conditions um, um, in 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 the national, regional, and, and local um, circumstances. Um, what could um, be done is indeed to see whether some additional European uh, funding. I'm not saying funds, but funding could be provided uh, to 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 help low-income households. Um, uh, there are some ideas, some some hooks at least were were included in the renovation wave strategy, uh, possibly even from the ETS. Um, if the ETS basically uh, leads to the inclusion of heating and cooling, that some additional funding from from there could be provided, but also from other um, um, cohesion policy instruments which we have and 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 so on. Uh, but even that would would then have to go through the member states and should actually in my view go, go through the member states the commission cannot micromanage this uh, in in so different uh, uh, circumstances as we find them across the European Union um, so it will require a, a pol political decision um, by 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 the by the national politicians and the local regional politicians how to do that precisely but the uh, the good practices, but also the the, the direction um, um, can of course be indicated um, from from the European level. Um, and uh, what you said also about uh, the minimum energy performance standards, there it's a similar challenge. Um, we will not be able and and should not impose from the European level a uniform a uniform uh, uh, rule book on minimum energy performance standards for everyone the same. But as you said, a, a framework, um, and I fully agree what you said, a sufficient, with sufficient flexibility for member states. Um, also, what is realistic um, for different types of buildings and so on. So that will be very difficult to 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 design, I would say, in a in a way which is both effective but also politically acceptable. Um, so that is um, uh, what what I would like to say at this stage. Um, uh, what is also extremely important, I think some of uh, you, you both mentioned that, uh, is the, the data issue. Evidence uh, is very important. Um, um, uh, knowledge, creation of knowledge, uh, deep analysis, uh, where it makes sense to renovate, and the long-term renovation strategies are the essential tools. They, they are basically um, the, 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 the reference, the reference to be established, uh, which will guide and also motivate the, the the actors at national, regional, local level to 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 take action, uh, because they have then a framework in which they can operate. They also need some certainty how, what how strong the commitments are from from the national governments, and what funding can can be provided uh, by using European money, but not only. Also, national money will play a big role. State aid, in particular. And uh, we are conscious also of the fact that the state aid guidelines need to be improved at European level to uh, to provide more flexibility and, and more openness to um, invest in efficiency more broadly, but also renewable energy. So thank you very much for for that. Um, and then of course I'm happy to to answer any any other questions from my point of view. Thank you. Very good. And I'll, thank you so much. And I can repeat what I mentioned before, but we've also got a lot of other questions. So maybe I can just, um, I will be happy to um, pose a question 
orally. So, Andrews, if you can just prepare yourself, uh, my colleagues will shortly unmute you, but I'll mention the question I um, read before. So, we had a question from uh, FEANSA, the European Federation of National Organizations working with homeless, and Clotilde Clark Volker was uh, especially worried that could the renovation wave lead into increasing rents and what can be done um, to ensure that um, lowest income groups are not further excluded. So it goes back to some of what uh, some of the comments you made already earlier, um, but just wanted to raise this again. Also something um, I would like to pick up on is the question on the long-term renovation strategies. We've heard from various uh, speakers today how serious issue it is that member states haven't delivered on them. So what can really be done now to get member states to take needed action? And I'll take a third question from Rafael Pauschitz, who's asking that does the renovation wave strategy also take into account the em embodied energy of construction and insulation materials? That And how can we ensure that uh, while a renovation wave takes place, that uh, we're not and we do not end up um, investing more energy in re renovation. That what could be saved um, in the process. So those were some questions, and I would say that they are especially targeted to uh, uh, Mr. Moser. But then Andres Petersons, you also had a question. My colleagues will unmute you now. Yes. Hello. Do you hear me? Yes, Hello? I can hear you. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting seminar. Um, I uh, actually uh, want to kind of uh, add to something that Louisa said because I was not even sure if this would be mentioned because I want to speak in my own personal capacity because I'm a homeowner who recently completed renovation and uh, I want to kind of mention how things are on the ground because I am concerned that some of those projects that are funded with European money can actually damage the environment because the, the, the projects are kind of not tailor made for different local projects as Louisa mentioned and, and that there are these differences and uh, for example digital like they are laying cables in the ground where currently ever all the digital uh, um, uh, connections are wireless so you don't need to do this this is kind of waste of money and 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 and, and I don't know damage to to the to the environment and this um, the second thing is ETS because the, this is a European competence and therefore member states are a bit driven by that. And my concern is that the push for energy efficiency may actually um, uh, transform the housing because uh, at least from where I come from in, 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 in Latvia, they have um, these projects uh, that they want to limit the use of uh, wood, wood heated houses simply because of energy efficiency while at the same time there are car uh, emissions and then they don't plant trees where they should be and so therefore uh, I own a home with wood heated by wood and I don't want to change it because you know I believe improvement uh, means different things for different people so we have to take that into consideration when we do renovations that I want to make a choice to be independent and the freedom that is so important for each person, each human being, to kind of have the diverse uh, home environment, because I believe that the dry heating and less, let's say the energy efficiency that is so driven by uh, the, the windows that have to be a certain way that they don't let you know uh, air through that it can be actually bad for health, for, for lungs, for, for skin and so on. So we need to take this uh, into account in my opinion, as well as of course environmentally friendly, environmentally friendly materials which uh, should be encouraged somehow, because otherwise we will end up with all these renovations that will be only glass and concrete. And do we really want that in Europe? And finally, my, 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 my comment would be that we need to kind of balance it out because for example, my house is, is, is in, the, in the area where there's lots of forest around. So, you know, what emissions would those be in comparison to what the, the trees do? While if you have, let's say a city center, there would be a bit different kind of environment than, than the suburbs of, of the city. So all these things need to be taken into consideration. Thank you very much for, 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 for this event. Thank you. Thank you very much.
I would like to, I know that it's already, and this is especially for uh, Pascal and Luis, when we have some given objectives being put forward in the renovation wave, like doubling the race of energy renovation, do you find that these are the right objectives? And we had a question from A.O. and Kelly, strengthen heating and cooling decarbonization goals. And is this something where you see that more should be done? But um, we have a number of questions there. Um, Stefan Moser, can I come to you first, um, as there are a number posed to you? <laughs> Thank you very much, um, uh, Anika, and uh, and um, to those of you having asked the questions. Um, uh, homeless people or, or lower income people, I think uh, it's, it's indeed a, a major concern not to increase rents uh, in a way which would uh, be more than uh, the benefits for the people, and there are even absolute uh, limits what uh, lower income uh, households can actually pay. So it's it is basically uh, an issue of, of social policies. Um, uh, I think um, um, this cannot, it cannot be entirely excluded that there will be an increase in, in rents. Um, but I think um, where this happens, there would have to be a kind of social policy reaction um, because, um, uh, and of course, uh, there can be public money also being invested and, and subsidies can be given to renovate. So actually that the renovation costs from the from the very start and therefore also the pressure on rents would would remain lower. But this is this is really for the national and 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 possibly regional and, and local authorities to 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 flesh out and see how this can be designed. Um, it is um, uh, I think it would go beyond the competence of the European level to to uh, to even uh, try to develop rules on this. Uh, on the long-term renovation strategies, um, uh, half of the member states have delivered, half of them have not yet finalized uh, their renovation strategy, but this does not mean that nothing has been done. So uh, most member states have already, um, uh, of those who have not completed their renovation strategy, have done already quite a number of um, efforts, and they are uh, on, on, on track, I would say, to deliver most of them by the end of the year. This is, of course, not ideal because the initial deadline was March, but of course we had also the pandemic crisis, and, um, and, uh, which is not an excuse, but of course has, has led to difficulties everywhere. And uh, what is crucial now is that uh, the remaining ones will proceed very quickly, and especially that the quality very, will be very high because that, I think, is, is the, the most important thing. We are very reassured, however, that from the 13 uh, long-term renovation strategies which exist, they are very good ones. So uh, if I mention just one country, uh, I should mention Spain. The Spanish strategy is, is probably exemplary and should serve as an inspiration for others. So it shows that it is possible to have very high quality renovation strategies. Um, but also other long-term renovation strategies are have very good elements. And we are going to publish uh, a working document from the Commission side, um, if possible, still before the end of the year, to help uh, those member states which still need to make improvements uh, or go the last mile to to get inspiration, and also the others which which might actually benefit from 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 learning from each other. So uh, I think no one has invented the silver bullet, but uh, there are a number of good elements which which uh, which can be used uh, across the borders in terms of uh, good practices. Um, um, it is very crucial um, to to think about the life cycle. So what what uh, um, one participant said about uh, the construction insulation materials, um, uh, think also about the energy being used for that, fully agree. Uh, there should be a life cycle thinking in relation to what we do and what we use, um, and not just uh, a narrow focus on, on energy efficiency uh, for the building as such as it stands, but looking at the, at the bigger picture. This is, of course, more easily said than done uh, because data may not be available for all these things. And that underlines, again, the need to, to further upgrade the quality of data available to, to facilitate informed decision making um, by, by those involved. Um, so it's, it's work in progress, but uh, life cycle thinking and quality of data are key and have to be further developed. Um, a similar issue is uh, what was said on on not to overbuild, not to basically 
damage the environment to think about for instance cables can it be done wireless yes of course that has to be reflected and factored in um the, the to look for the least impact solution the 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 most effective and least impact solution which currently exists we know that there will be further technological progress if cables are no longer needed because everything can be done wireless all the better but of course some cables will be needed notably when it comes to linking the different sectors transport for instance about charging uh, stations in a building about taking up uh, renewable energy from the local environment uh, producing or making a building fit for producing um, renewable energy on the roof, for instance, solar energy, that you do need cables. So some cables will always be needed, but it has to be basically the the latest state of art, which is which is used and with the lowest possible impact. And of course, um, prioritizing wireless solutions. Of course, uh, also making sure that there's not too much radiation or or impact on people. Some people are very sensitive to electromagnetic uh, waves, uh, so that also has to be um, factored into that. Uh, use of um, nature-based solutions, absolutely yes. Uh, use of wood and, and other natural natural components, nat natural materials, uh, not only glass and concrete, definitely. That is one of the, uh, the, uh, the, the key aspects of the strategy. Think basically uh, outside the box. Um, um and and uh and look at the whole range of available products of course always looking also at possible hazards um, um fire prevention um and so on uh, they will not be a kind of one size fits all um this is basically an invitation when it comes to concrete projects to think about uh, the whole range of aspects uh, and then try to make the best out of it um on the ETS, um, uh, it was briefly mentioned again. Um, I mentioned that also uh, previously, it will not be the silver bullet solution either. It is uh, addressing some of the economic uh, incentives needed to decarbonize, notably heating, heating and cooling. Um, but it will not be the only one. Uh, it will be an instrument standing alongside other uh, instruments. And that has been said also by the Commission, both in the climate target plan, but also in the renovation wave strategy. So I think that's that's what I uh, have seen I should react to. And then, um, of course, I think the others are for Louise and Pascal also. Absolutely. So I'll be happy to turn to Pascal for further comments. Thank you. <laughs> so these were lots of questions. So starting with, uh, uh, with the, the, the low income, uh, uh, Households and, uh, and and the cost of renovation. I think, uh, like Louise said, this is where we need very much to target uh, the financial effort, uh, both in terms of subsidies, but also in terms of uh, long-term uh, 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 loans with uh, zero interest rate. I think uh, it's a mechanism that can uh, that can work, and uh, this combination of subsidies plus long-term uh, zero interest rate uh, loan. Uh, shall be able to finance a deep renovation also for the poor. Uh, we shouldn't forget that uh, most of the time uh, it's not just a question of fuel poverty, it's also a question of poor indoor air quality. Those families living in, uh, in, uh, in uh, houses which are uh, uh, not properly fueled are often uh, also suffering from uh, asthma, from uh, different kinds of diseases. Uh, children are not uh, uh, given the right conditions to, to learn. So th th there are lots of uh, social implications that uh, justify uh, uh, an additional financial effort uh, towards those households. So I think uh, uh, this should be uh, thought both at a European level. So I, I think uh, we can't only rely uh, uh, on the member states to, 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 to think of how this uh, should be financed. So, uh, I fully agree with Luis that uh, this is typically something where uh, uh, at EU level th there should be uh, some responsibility taken to, 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 to think properly the financing of uh, deep renovation for, for, for this uh, household. When it comes to uh, renovation strategies by member states, I think, uh, well, it's good to know that uh, they will come, but uh, more importantly, they, they should be shared and uh, at, at local level. So it's, it, it shouldn't be, as it is too often, 
uh, a simple report to the Commission. It has to be a, a real strategic uh, policy document to be shared with all stakeholders at, uh, at, uh, at country level. This is really what we need uh, to give visibility to all uh, uh, players on the market. So to industries, to invest in capacity, to uh, installers and contractors to, to have the right skills and also to, to the households uh, and to the investors to know how much and by when they will need to invest. So th these uh, long-term renovation strategies are, are, are not just uh, a paper, they are a, a, a strategic tool uh, to, uh, to be implemented. Uh, when it comes to um, the, 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 the remarks regarding uh, uh, renovation and uh, the solutions to be implemented. First, I think that uh, uh, when uh, the, the regulation, the, the mandatory uh, performance requirements will have to be performance based uh, and not uh, solution uh, oriented. So we need to, to leave room for local adaptation and also room for uh, uh, competition between different uh, options. So there is uh, not one unique way of achieving a, a given uh, energy efficiency performance. So le le let's keep uh, flexibility open. Then uh, people saying that uh, putting more insulation might be uh, counterproductive. Uh, I think we need to, to kill this uh, fake news. <laughs> uh, there is no insulation. Uh, if, if you have a, a, an insulation material and this is measured, uh, uh, assessed with uh, LCA on one side and, uh, and calculation on the other side or measurement on side on the other side, uh, you have a positive balance. Uh, the, the energy saved by any insulation material is much higher than the energy that has been consumed to, to produce and, tr and transport uh, this material. So the, the, there is no question there. So, and uh, whatever the, the insulation material. Um, and uh, when we say, uh, do we want to have glass uh, and concrete, uh, at least for glass, uh, I don't know any way to, to do windows and to give uh, access to daylight and uh, to external view without using glass. So unless you go for plastics, uh, I'd, or, or let uh, uh, the wall completely open, but then I doubt you will get uh, comfort and you will get energy efficiency. So we have also to be very careful not to be, uh, uh, to, 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 not to, 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 to fall into uh, some kind of caricature, but to, 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 to remain realistic. If the real objective is to achieve decarbonization, we should take all uh, uh, the best possible available resources to, to achieve that. Of course, uh, uh, this has to be made uh, with uh, enough data to make uh, sensible uh, choices. So, uh, and uh, uh, while I am very confident that for major innovation, uh, making a whole life cycle approach, making the calculation will be feasible because for a major innovation, uh, it's very similar to new builds and uh, you have uh, contractors and you have specifiers who have the ability to, to make such calculations. I'm a bit more uh, anxious about uh, the small renovation works where uh, I, I'm not sure that uh, access to the information or even the capacity to make uh, calculations will be there. So it's clearly something to be worked out uh, in the future to, to allow for uh, the skills to be developed but uh, uh, giving data is, uh, is clearly a, a, a challenge, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that uh, this will be provided by, by manufacturer. And uh, uh, for sure, nature-based solution will, uh, will develop, but uh, uh, again, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's have them developed based on uh, sound and robust information. The, uh, there is a prejudice that uh, nature-based uh, is always better than uh, others uh, than alternatives. I can tell you that it is not always the case. Uh, so again, let's be uh, uh, as objective as possible. Let's uh, work with strong data, transparent information to make the best choices. But uh, it shows that we have a, a huge challenge also still in terms of uh, education, information to the general public, as well as towards the professionals. And this shouldn't be forgotten. Thank you. Uh, Louise, you have a chance to react as well. 
Anything you would uh, like to pick up on in the last few minutes we have? <laughs> yeah, exactly, though. We have just a few last minutes. So I think I'll possibly just pick up on the, the one question that I think um, hasn't been addressed really, which is, which is a, I think was, there was a question around the targets and, you know, are they the right ones? Um, and I certainly think, um, obviously, the ambition to double renovation activity across Europe is, you know, is big. It falls short, however. I think it's a kind of um, you know, accepted fact that we need to actually be tripling our, our renovation rates to, 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 to be in line with our kind of long term goal of decarbonizing the building stock by 2050. Um, and of course, if we don't, um, I, think, I think it was Pascal that said, if, if we don't increase the depth as well, we're talking, talking more like 15, 10 or 15 times the, the current rate. So I think in general, doubling the renovation rate is, is a great ambition. However, I think in the um, in the implementation of a lot of the measures through the legislative pieces that were coming up in the last kind of next kind of 18 months, I think we really should be looking to implement for, for a greater ambition than that. I think mindful of time, that's probably... <laughs> I fully understand. And we have had a number of questions coming in and I'm very sorry for our audience that we will not be able to pick up on all these interesting questions you've posed. However, uh, we'll be sharing these with all the speakers um, so that and uh, rest assured, uh, we have taken note of them and will be certainly considering them uh, should we plan another discussion on the renovation where this uh, we have managed to touch upon so many different topics and it shows how great the initiative is um, by the fact that it touches upon so many different sectors, so many different possibilities. It surely shows that it can be a true win-win-win if we get it right. But at the same time, the discussion has surely shown as well that there are a number of questions and barriers still to be addressed if we are to get this right. And um, so I think that we'll certainly need to continue the discussion. I would just like to end uh, by saying a big thank you, first of all, uh, to Eurima for joining us in this effort yeah, in sure. putting this discussion together. I think what we've seen today is that the renovation wave is surely an opportunity to mitigate climate change. But it's also and something we haven't really even been able to discuss that much. It's also a great opportunity to build resilience in the face of climate change. We talked about the possibilities it can provide for indoor air pollution. Another thing what I could have uh, added on here is also to meet the needs of an aging population. We have a lot of different uh, groups of people with different needs. And if we get this right, we can certainly help um, the vulnerable people in our societies. But uh, what we've heard today is also that uh, when we now move on to the process, we clearly need to make this participatory, involve the different stakeholders and we need to keep in mind the needs of the low income and the vulnerable people so that the solutions will be affordable and something that will benefit them as well. But thank you so much uh, for all of our participants for joining in for all the questions. Uh, we will certainly return to these. Um, this discussion is only starting and we are very delighted to have provided this opportunity for taking a stock where we are now and what are some of the elements that require further discussion. So thank you so much and wishing you a very good uh, afternoon and uh, stay safe. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you very much, uh, Annika, Louise, Pascal and everyone participating. Sorry again, I, they couldn't show my video. <laughs> thank Thanks you. So much. Next time.